Glasgow was a dancing mad city with crowds flocking to its many ballrooms. But for one young woman, a taxi ride home from a dance hall in October 1969 with a man she'd just met was destined to end in tragedy. As the cab made its way through the dark city streets, her fate was already sealed. It seemed she had been dancing with a killer. Helen Puttock's body was found in a back court behind these tenements. She'd been strangled. The cab she'd come home and dropped her off here in Earl Street in Glasgow, Scotston. Her murder shocked the city, reinforcing fears that a serial killer was on the loose. The discovery would instigate one of the biggest criminal investigations in Scottish legal history. The search for Bible John. Helen Puttock was a vivacious woman of 29. She was the mother of two little boys and was married to George Puttock, who was in the army. The couple had just returned from a posting in Germany. Helen was an absolute bubbly character, full of life, loved music, loved dancing, most of all doted on her two boys, lived for her two boys. But she was just a person that was totally full of beans all the time, not just odd occasions. Helen was never, never down. The young couple were living with Helen's mother in Earl Street. At the time, Glasgow was renowned for its glitzy ballrooms, and one of them, the Barrowland, was a favourite of Helen and her sister, Jeannie Langford. Dancing it was a, a major pastime in Glasgow. There was dance halls in almost every major street. Barrowland was the place that the people flocked to, but it was also a place that, that people went to, not always with their partners or their husbands or wives. Thursday was the night when it was colloquially here as grab a granny. When you went along there and you could finish up going away with a, a girlfriend at the end of the evening. On the night that Helen was tragically killed, she said to me that she was going out with her sister to the Barrowland for dancing. I wasn't exactly happy about that at the time but I was assured that it was something that the girls had done on several occasions. And while I was apprehensive, it wasn't really right to stand in her way. And so I gave Jeannie a 10 shilling note to make sure that they got a taxi home. They'd headed into Traders Tavern, which is in Kent Street um, within the Glasgow area. They had a, a few drinks there and then they made their way to the dancing at the Barrowlands. Um, during the course of the evening, Helen and her sister Jean had met um, two people. One who became known as Castle Milk John and um, another male who had given his name as John as well. At the end of the evening, Castle Milk John made his own way home and the two young women ended up sharing a taxi with the charming stranger Helen had met at the Barrowland. Jean got out first, leaving her sister in the taxi with her new companion. Hi. Hi. The cab dropped them off at 95 Earl Street around 1 a.m., just yards away from Helen's home. There'd been no sign of Helen coming home. I started to get a little bit worried and concerned. And I just didn't think that she would not come home to her two boys and not be there in the morning when her two boys woke up. And so I sat really worrying myself over it. But eventually, which I can only assume must have been two or three o'clock in the morning, I obviously fell asleep. A few
few hours later, a neighbor in Errol Street found the body. One of the residents from the flats was walking his dog and found Helen's body lying in the back court. She was clothed. Um, she had been strangled with what we believe was a pair of tights. There had been signs that there was a struggle and there was some marks around her face and body. I walked into the front room, immediately saw a police van and so I walked down and walked up the road. When I got to the police van, I said to the policeman inside the van, could you please tell me what's going on? As my wife went out last night and she hasn't come home. The first question he asked me was, what was she wearing? And as soon as I said, an imitation fur ocelet coat, he took me into the caravan and said to me that uh, she had been murdered. Helen hadn't been the first young woman to die, but it was only with the discovery of her body that a pattern seemed to emerge. Twenty months earlier, 25-year-old nurse Patricia Docker had gone dancing at the Barrowland. It was a night that would end with her murder. Her body was found the following morning. At that time it was just going to be another Glasgow murder if there is such a, such a thing. And we covered the, the story and there was nothing untoward about it. But it was some time later that things developed when, about 18 months later, uh, another body was found. The second victim was Jemima MacDonald. Her body was found by her sister in a derelict tenement, just yards from her home in McKeith Street. Police found that plenty of people had seen Jemima at the Barrowland. She was also seen in the company of a male who was very smartly dressed, um, who was described at that time by a number of people as being sort of 25 to 35. Um, reddish auburn hair, there's some discrepancies, people have said he had dark hair. Witnesses gave such a good description of the man seen with Jemima that the police released a black and white drawing. Like Patricia, she had been strangled and she had been menstruating. It was ten weeks later, after Helen Puttock's body was discovered, that these similarities would take on a massive significance. Finding the man in the taxi became the police's top priority. A while after the case, I had reason to meet the taxi driver. He'd only been on the taxis a couple of nights, so he wasn't familiar with the route. And in actual fact, he had taken a wrong turn in. And it's my understanding that Helen was so fed up with him going wrong that she just said, stop here, I'll get out here. The person in the taxi with her quickly paid the taxi driver jumped out, ran across the road, got hold of her, but she was resisting him getting hold of her, but the taxi driver said he just thought it was two lovers having a tiff. The details of Helen's murder brought a chilling echo of the deaths of the other two young women. We were all picked, and picked up at, at the dancing. The second similarity is that they were all menstruating at the time. And the third set morality is that they were all strangled. Um, we believe by items of their own clothing. Helen Puttock's murder sparked what was to become one of Scotland's biggest manhunts. The investigation got off to a flying start because police had a unique witness, Helen's sister Jean, who had spent time in the company of the prime suspect. I, in my wisdom, suggested that uh, since the witness who was in the taxi, that is, the murdered lady's sister, saw everything, heard everything in the taxi, she may well be a good candidate for hypnosis. And of course at that time everybody would burst out laughing. However, Joe Beatty contacted me personally and said, here son, that's a good idea. She was able to remember quite a few details of the conversation in the taxi from Barrowland to her home in Yoker. The police did tell us that the genie had been a vital witness because she had spent so long in the company of this man that she was able to give him a detailed description as to his appearance. And then they came out with the thing that really sparked it all off for me when they said that 
he quoted extensively from the Bible and they knew that his name was John so I thought that'll do me and I just went on to the, the desk to the news editor and I said this is a terrific story here I suggest we call this man Bible John Police were so confident about Jean's description, they approached Lennox Patterson of Glasgow School of Art to create a portrait of Bible John, the face that was to haunt Glasgow for years to come. When it was shown to Jeannie, she gave an involuntary gasp and said, my God, I've got a feeling in my stomach that that is him. He was said to have had a military bearing, so uh, th th they started interviewing soldiers who were uh, home on leave at the time. It, so, some thought he might even have been a, a, a police officer. This is the fellow we're looking for. It touched everybody. I mean, hairdressers were interviewed, dentists were interviewed. Possibly there wouldn't be one family in the west of Scotland that didn't have a relative or, uh, you know, didn't have a friend who was somehow interviewed by police. That's how wide the investigation was. In what was one of the most unusual lines of inquiry, police officers were instructed to take to the dance floor to try to track down the killer. There was a connection with the Battleland and the suspect and the victims. It was decided uh, to flood the place with police officers inside and out. Uh, so much so that the policemen were referred to by the, lo the local punters as the Partick Police Formation Dancing Team. You actually went and danced other girls in the dance hall, talking to them, telling them who you were and telling them why you were there. And the idea was that if Jeannie, that was the, vic the third victim's sister, saw uh, the man she identified or would identify as Bible John, there'd be plenty of people there to take hold of him and he wouldn't escape. I used to accompany Jean to the dancing. Jeannie was very popular among the male dancers and I could stand back and say to Jeannie, you go and enjoy yourself dancing. If you see anyone like the suspect, you know I'm over here. At first it seemed that Jean would be an invaluable bonus to the inquiry. But were police looking in the wrong place? Everything we were doing was based on Jean's statement. And I felt that was wrong. And I felt there was too much emphasis being placed on that statement and the way in the inquiry was being led along by this. The man in charge of the hunt for Bible John was legendary Glasgow cop Joe Beatty, but the case was to prove a massive challenge, even for him. Joe Beatty was a very dedicated officer, and he worked long hours, as, uh, uh, as many hours as his men did. But they always uh, told me that if he came face to face with Bible John, he would be able to recognise him. And quite often you would see him pull a wee magnifying glass out, look at a photograph, and say, no, his teeth are too long, and he would throw it away. So that's not him, that's not him, you know. And he would, he would rule people out of the inquiry by photograph himself. The next thing is, who sent that boy in? I sent him in, Mr. Beatty. That was the boy last night. Well, he was very good, Ron. He was excellent, I would say, except he was a little short in height. Joe Beatty came to the flat and said to me, sorry, son, but can you go into the bedroom and strip off? And he came in and searched my body, obviously, for any marks or anything like that. And when he'd finished, he slapped me on the backside and said, I'm sorry, old fella. It had to be done, but I knew the minute I met you, it was nothing to do with you. It's a lonely job. You're on your own. Everybody, the public thinks you're wonderful if you clear the crime up. You're an idiot if you don't. But you do need the luck. And I would say, thinking back to when Joe BT was working there almost 24 hours a day, in fact, seven days a week, he didn't get that lucky break that you really need. They couldn't see the wood for the trees, I think, to be honest with you. And all the eggs were placed in the one basket, namely uh, Jeannie Langford's uh, recollection of what, what had happened that night. She was desperate to help us catch the killer of her sister. There's no doubt about that. But the situation was, I felt that uh, really 
there, there, would, there was probably a situation where she was trying to give too much help. What we were working on was her interpretation of what the killer looked like. It was not a photograph. It wasn't any other thing other than an artist's impression. I would not have based as much emphasis on that. <laughs> but it wasn't only Jeannie who had got a good look at the tall man with Helen. He had drawn himself to the attention of the bouncers at the dance hall by creating a fuss when the two women had trouble with a cigarette machine. The situation with regards to the description given by Jean was that uh, we more or less were told that the, the man's hair was, was red. The bouncers said it definitely wasn't. That can throw everybody off. If Jeannie could have been mistaken about the red hair, how much reliance could be put on her evidence about John's talk of the Bible? These Bible quotes weren't specific Bible quotes that, that you would need to know um, a lot about the Bible to, to speak about. And these were quotes that somebody might say in everyday normal sort of language. Um, there's nothing unusual about them. The fact that there was biblical quotations said at that time um, would appear to have been blown out of proportion and there's maybe too much importance put on what was said in the taxi journey. The police were getting nowhere in their search for Helen Puttock's killer. With every dead end they reached, the spectre of Bible John loomed larger over the city of Glasgow. The unwitting creation of a Bible-quoting serial killer in the minds of the public by the police and the media would haunt the west of Scotland for decades to come. It was a very emotive name for him, you know, and it seemed to, to strike a chord with, with people, you know, it's, it's very easy to say, oh, that's Bible John, I remember that case, rather than say, oh, I remember that murder, I wonder who that was, you know. It was the first time, really, that uh, people had in their minds that a serial killer uh, was stalking the streets of Glasgow and uh, uh, I mean for example uh, it was a bogeyman figure and uh, mothers used to give their kiddies a row and say you better watch out or Bible John will get you. With the face of Bible John haunting the billboards and newspapers of Glasgow like a ghost there was one piece of evidence which was useless to police in the late 60s a semen stain on Helen's tights. It wouldn't be until 1996, with advances in the study of DNA, that it would prove to be helpful. In a move that shocked Scotland, Strathclyde police exhumed the body of one of the case's prime suspects, John McInnes, who had committed suicide in 1980. I think the exhumation of John McInnes was probably the grimmest and, and one of the most disturbing moments or, or periods of of, the, of of my life as a journalist. The exhumation was carried out in the very early morning and that it was scarcely daylight. The temperature was way below zero. The whole area, the trees, the ground, the fences, the gravestones, everything was shrouded in, in hoar frost. Uh, it, it was truly a, an absolute macabre scene. Hollywood couldn't have done it better. The coffin was discovered, dug out and removed to the city morgue in Glasgow. Initially I think it was thought that the DNA was so denatured that they couldn't make the minds up one way or an, on another, but obviously DNA has made large strides in terms of what we can do with DNA nowadays. And uh, with the tests available nowadays, the person we exhumed was not the person that was being looked for in terms of the Bible John crimes. At that time, the test proved inconclusive. But I can tell you that the DNA stain recovered in the clothing of Helen Puttock is not John McInnes's. Another blind alley. And 36 years later, the man known as Bible John, the killer of Helen Puttock, remains undiscovered. For all these years, the public have accepted that if the man in the taxi was traced, he would be the killer of Helen, Pat Docker and Jemima MacDonald. But could it be possible that for all this time, the search for Bible John has masked the existence of two or even three killers? 
Bible John, to my mind, was a pure tabloid invention. There never was a, a chain of evidence which would suggest one man was solely responsible for the, the Bible John murders. That didn't exist. There were coincidences. You need an awful lot more than that to suggest a serial killer. So was there such a person as Bible John, the scripture quoting serial killer with a distinctive red hair? Today's officers reviewing the case are cautious. I would say it was a myth. What has actually been uttered by this suspect, if you can call him a suspect, the person that accompanied Helen Puttock back in the taxi, it's nothing out of the ordinary. Obviously the creation of the name Babel John uh, lives long in people's memories. Uh, at the time, the three murders, the murder of, of, of Patricia Docker, Jemaine MacDonald and Helen Puttock were investigated separately. They were investigated as three separate murders. That's the case at the moment. They still are being looked at as three separate incidents. If they were separate murders, then you would expect the killings to stop. And if it was a serial killer, as it has been portrayed, but we're treating it uh, as three separate, then you would have expected that person to go on and continue um, killing. For Helen's husband and her two boys, the agony has continued long after her death. Everything that's been written, every headline, has been Bible John. What about Helen Puttock? and anybody else that Bible John might have been responsible for killing. My feelings about the person that done this to my wife is one of utter disgust how a human being can do what he done to a fellow, firstly a fellow human being. But if only he knew the hurt that he caused to the amount of people whose lives he completely and utterly ruined and whose lives will never be the same. We have been 36 years living with the horrors of that night and I just hope and pray that as a result of this new investigation the person responsible is finally found.